I'm Emily Saxon from the Law Department here at LSU, and on behalf of Birkbeck Law School and um, the Law Department of LSU, welcome to a seminar in honour of our dear colleague, Helen Rees. I'm really pleased to see so many familiar and also some new faces, although obviously it goes without saying that we all wish we were here to discuss Helen's research in very different circumstances. There's water and cakes at the back, so please, this is very informal, do feel free to just go and help yourself if you uh, would like some sustenance. And then at six o'clock, the plan is that we all go upstairs in the lifts to the eighth floor of this building, where we're going to have a reception with more guests, so more people from um, colleagues of Helen's in the law department here. And at 6.30, um, we've got five people, each of whom are going to say something about different aspects of Helen's professional life. A few weeks before Helen died, she was due to give a staff seminar here at LSE based on the paper uh, which was circulated to you in advance. If anyone would like copies, we've got some hard copies at the back, so do please feel free to help us out. In the end, Helen was too old to come in and give that seminar, and when a group of us were thinking about a way to commemorate Helen's extraordinary contribution to legal scholarship in the area of family law, it seemed appropriate to hold a seminar to discuss her ideas, and in particular to discuss this paper which she had hoped would be the subject of really vigorous engagement with her colleagues in a seminar room just across the hallway here um, only seven months ago. So to start off what I hope will be a really robust and lively discussion this afternoon, we've got four very distinguished speakers, each of whom are going to share their thoughts and their comments on Helen's paper. But 10 to 15 minutes each. Unless any of them go on and on and on and on, on and on, I'm not proposing to flag up <laughs> five minutes uh, at them. I want this to be an informal and celebratory uh, event. Um, but we're going to go through without a break. So uh, after each, each of them has spoken, we'll open up and we'll have plenty of time for a general discussion. So if you've got any very specific questions for any of them, please hold that thought and make a note of it and you can raise it uh, in the discussion. So, without further ado, can I introduce the speakers running um, from um, as far away from me. Mavis McLean is a senior research fellow in the Faculty of Law at Oxford, with a very long and distinguished record at Oxford and in the Lord Chancellor's Department, the more recently the Ministry of Justice, of uh, carrying out research in family law and policy and the family justice system. Mavis was also my first academic boss, so it's a great pleasure to welcome her back here. Jonathan Herring is a professor of law at the University of Oxford and a leading scholar not only in family law, but also medical law and criminal law. And Jonathan has also been carving out some new and neglected subjects in law, including elder law, care law, most recently law and vulnerability. <coughs> Jenny Bristow is a senior lecturer at the School of Psychology, Politics and Sociology at Canterbury Christchurch University and an associate of the Centre for Parenting Culture Studies. Jenny's research focuses on education, intergenerational conflict, and parenting cultures. John Gardner, immediately to my left, is a senior research fellow at All Souls College, Oxford, and a professor of law and philosophy in the University of Oxford. John's area of expertise is the philosophy of law, including private law, philosophy of private law, criminal law, public law, and more broadly moral and political philosophy. So, over to Mavis first. Okay, thank you, Emily, very much. We all decided we'd sit down, mainly because these chairs are so intriguing. <laughs> <laughs> if I suddenly sort of disappear and like whirl a little bit or something, I apologise. Anyway. Um, not sure if everybody's read the paper, so uh, just to remind you of the title, was there, is there, should there be a presumption against deviant parents in residence disputes? What a wonderful piece. It's, it's actually the very essence of Helen. It's scholarly, it's original, it's provocative, it's funny. And just when the arguments take off into the stratosphere, in comes the common sense. On the last page, she bounces back to earth saying firmly, judges just do have to make decisions. You can hear her saying it, can't she? Mm -hmm. And where deviance plays a role, they should ensure they exercise both imagination and caution. Well, I think that, that sums it up. And well, one would hope they might do that anyway, not just wait for the deviance, but uh, fun. And I think Helen had fun with this one. I think she begins by paying due respect to the notion that deviance is difference, not always to be seen as a negative. Then she argues against the circularity of the concept of deviance as being that which is discriminated against. And then she goes on to suggest that when looking to the child's future, 
but there are benefits which may arise from experience of different lifestyles and values. I would have loved here to have seen a reference to shared parenting and its place on this sinful to saintly uh, spectrum because it certainly deviates from uh, the average as a parenting style. But she uh, first addresses and stresses the fluidity of conceptions of deviance quite properly. And her first example is uh, the lesbian gay issue, now officially no longer stained with deviance. And then she turns to naturism, which is fun, uh, including. I don't think ever one read one other paper on naturism in a socio-legal setting, and that was in, in Poland with uh, Jacek Kaczewski and Co., which was rather different. But, um, anyway. <laughs> Helen, you can tell Helen, us about that over <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll talk about that later. Uh, Helen, Hel Helen on naturism, um, she, she includes naked family bathing, as in the case of the W 1999, where Elizabeth Butler Soss, although moving on from the earlier habit of linking naturism with abuse, does still speak of the need for a balance to be struck between, I'm quoting Helen, the behaviours within families seen by them as natural and the sincerely held views of others who are shocked by it. Well, Helen's great talent, I always think, was not just raising questions uh, herself, but prodding other people into developing their own questions. So I've got a couple uh, which um, began to uh, tease my brain after reading this lovely paper. Um, the first is about the parenting of deviant children, and the second was the question of, uh, well, when we're talking about um, making decisions in uh, residence cases, uh, we so often talk about it as if it's a, a calm sea, whereas actually if people have got as far as court, these kids are in a war zone. But um, just, just briefly, to go back, uh, what's the time, sorry, um, on, on lesbian and gay issues, uh, it, it's funny to think that it's 20 years since Helen first wrote about these issues. In fact, it's, it's 30 years since I first read about them. I examined mm -hmm. Julia Brophy's thesis in 1987, that's how old I am, on the politics of child custody a study of sexuality and social control, lesbian mothers, the courts, and the status quo hypothesis. And there are quotes there which make your hair stand on end. LVL, 1976, there were three expert psychiatrists um, uh, being witnessed, two of whom said that being raised by a lesbian mother would, not could, might, maybe, would lead to psychological damage. And in the following year, 1977, McTee versus McTee, the magistrate referred to the lesbian mother as perverted and vile, saying the children would, again, no could or might or anything, suffer gossip and taunts. Now, isn't it wonderful that this is all now a distant memory, and instead we have Susan Gollenbock bringing together all the research uh, that we will ever need to know in modern families making it absolutely clear that children in lesbian, gay, solo mother, sister reproduction, and, and any other form of new modern family you can think of are indistinguishable from children in traditional form families in terms of their psychological well-being, except that the new family forms showed higher quality parenting. So there we are. So no problems where the parents are deviant, parents are doing a good job. But the, the question that, that is beginning to sort of nibble around the edges of um, my mind, and I think there is evidence uh, to be published quite, quite shortly, I'm sorry it isn't published in time for this seminar, uh, about the impact of, it's really about the impact of the wider society uh, when it's the children who are out of the ordinary, um, uh, maybe gay or lesbian. And there is, uh, I think, some rather worrying evidence forthcoming that serious psychological problems are more common for these children in secondary school populations, which is where they've been observed. But that's, that's the question which Helen prompted me to worry about. 
Um, but that leads us back to Helen's arguments about the effect of social isolation on the child of parents who belong to a different and enclosed <coughs> group, though not to a group with, which may be different, but has close connections with many parts of society. And I love her wicked comparison of the impact of being brought up by Jehovah's, Jehovah's <laughs> Witnesses or being brought up by family law professors. <laughs> Not much in it, except that the latter will have an open future exposed to many different kinds of settings. But the next bit of the paper really hit me between the eyes when um, she suggests that when all the available expert evidence is presented, and the judge needs to decide whether or not a parent who happens to be different in some way from the majority will be able to act in the best interest of the child. We all know what Helen thinks about the best interest of the child. Um, but she says very clearly the judge may not be able to see past the way that research is value driven and how political goals penetrate right to the heart of our understanding of children's welfare. But there comes a, a bolt of the right in the middle. Um, if we do take a look, for example, at the resurgence of the shared parenting debate, and it's, uh, there is a private member's bill uh, lurking at the moment, here we have a movement which attempts to support the position of men as equal time, hands-on parents. Now, this could have the benign effect of liberating women, giving them more time and energy for their work or whatever else, having their toenails painted. Uh, and ensure that children benefit from the input of two devoted parents, not just one parent and one visitor. But uh, I do miss Helen's voice on this topic now, asking whether we are seeing men attempting to take control of parenting or harm mothers or simply to benefit much-loved children. There is a wealth of material, uh, as I hope I've indicated in this article. Um, I think that I'm running out of time. Um, I think I'll, I'll close by saying that she does also, I think, make very clear the point which is often forgotten, that the parents are not the only factor determining the <coughs> happiness and well-being of the child. The, um, the importance of the wider community um, is clearly there throughout the paper. Uh, but uh, within this wider community, the, the smaller community, the tight community, uh, the, um, the nature of the family unit in which the child will be living, I think the particular situation of children involved in a residence case, we need to acknowledge that there's a difference between um, the wider variation in social life, which may be manageable for a child who lives within a united the um, family without uh, a, a high level of, of conflict, it may be much harder to manage this difference when it's part of the ongoing dispute between two parents, and particularly if the issue of difference is part of the ongoing dispute. I think that's something which we haven't thought about so much. And that the children who come before a court are not exactly being helped along a primrose path, and this may exacerbate some of the issues associated with social difference even when it's not harmful in itself. So that's my thank you to Helen, not just for uh, her own thoughts, but for her sticking pins in the further recesses of my aged brain and mm -hmm. helping me to think about new things. Thank you, Mary. Thank you very much. It's an honor and, and a sadness to, uh, to be here today. I was uh, fortunate enough to have one of my books uh, reviewed by Helen, and her review opened with this sentence. Um, it's become a standing joke between Jonathan Herring and me that we never agree on anything. So it becomes as no surprise to me, and will come as no surprise to him, that I entirely disagree <laughs> with the fundamental point of his book. She goes on to explain how wrong-headed and agitating it was. <laughs> There's not many people who I think I'll take that from, but, but <laughs> Ellen was one of the, the very few because she was such a careful and kindly uh, reviewer and thinker. Um, and so taking uh, that on board, I'll uh, make some critical comments about <laughs> Helen's response. But, but first start with a personal anecdote, only because I know Helen would find this hilarious. And this was 
uh, recently my uh, daughter's support worker came to see uh, my partner and I, and so they were very worried about her because she had extreme anti-men view and feminist views. Um, and I was uh, automatically thought, my goodness, we're going to have the uh, social services come in and start a full investigation. Uh, fortunately, my, my middle daughter said, um, when they asked her what she thought of men, she said, I like men, especially, <laughs> especially tanned men with six packs. So I think was, uh, we were, at that point, uh, <laughs> they were convinced we were not sort of radicalizing our family into some extreme uh, feminist cult or something. Um, the article that Helen writes inevitably raises the question, well, what, what are deviants? Uh, and I think that is a, a, a troublesome concept. She, uh, it's clear that it's not a statistical thing. We're not just describing a, a group that is a minority. Uh, it's a group that attracts, or a group of people who attract social disapproval. Um, and it's clear the focus of her article is not on, uh, particularly on all deviants, because she says someone who abuses their child would be regarded as a deviant, would be subject to social disapproval. And of course, there wouldn't be a she doesn't have a particular difficulty with that. But it's where the harm is not being caused by the parent to the child, but it's the disapproval towards the parent that is causing harm to the child. She talks about a collateral harm to the child as a byproduct of society's view that these parents are deviants. Um, so it's only a subcategory of deviant parents that she's uh, concerned with. But I think that is a very troublesome line to draw. How do we know whether this is actually the harm that's directly being caused by the parent to the child, or whether it's a byproduct of the disapproval of the parent? So, for example, the parent commits some heinous crime, and there's a lot of publicity, and the parent's sent to prison, the child will feel embarrassment and shame. Does that fall within this category of deviant parents um, or not? So it is an ambiguous concept, and, and, and Helen acknowledges that. Um, in her title, she asks three questions. Has there been a presumption against deviant parents? Um, I think she's right. Yes, there has been. I'm, I'm not going to uh, dispute that. Is there now? Well, the first thing that's rather odd is that she cites one case in support of the argument there is now, uh, the VW naturism case, and it's a case that goes back to 1999. Uh, so, well, that's 18 years ago. Um, so it's slightly unusual to be using such an old case to, to support a, a, a current thing. Secondly, it's, uh, as Mavis explained, it's a case involving naturism. Um, now, is naturism attracting social disapproval? That's the, the definition of deviant groups. Uh, and certainly it seems to me that would be very odd. Um, I had some fun looking up uh, in Google Daily Mail and nudists. To see what they come up. <laughs> That's my story to the news office. Which was seven and a half. And uh, basically it falls into three categories. One is stories where uh, naturists catch pieces of their anatomy in fishing nets. In the of the musing tales. Uh, Secondly, there seem to be lots of stories about German nudists. I don't know why, there's a whole great long list of them. Uh, and then there's stories about Muslims trying to catch sight of nudists. Um, and those seem to be the entire category of the Daily Mail's presentation of nudists in recent years. There have been various documentaries on Channel 4 about nudists, and it seems basically the picture they're presented to perhaps a slight giggle, uh, perhaps slightly, um, slightly sad. Um, but there's no suggestion in any of those that, that naturists are in any way uh, uh, socially harmful or, or subject to disapproval. Uh, it seems amusement uh, and pity, perhaps, um, uh, and, and perhaps even in some cases envy, but, but, but not social disapproval. So it seems to me to fail to, to be a category of disapproval groups. Even if we put that to one side, if we look at the particular case uh, in, in question, it's clear from Lady Butler's loss's judgment that the real problem now was that the father was disapproving of the nudism. 
Um, it wasn't the, the it wasn't society's disapproval which was causing the, the concern to the courts. It was the fact that the mother and the stepfather were being nude in front of the children. Um, indeed, it seems to me fairly clear that Lady Butler's lawsuit was, was thought there was no problem at all in this case had the um, uh, birth father not uh, of, had, had, had any concerns. So the concerns raised by the case are not the public, public disapproval of the parents so much as the, uh, the father's disapproval of the new discipline. So again, it doesn't really seem to fall into this category of being uh, uh, a case about demons. Now, that said, I think Alan does make a fair point that his arguments, the father's arguments, were bolstered by the fact he could perhaps be seen as being reasonably concerned about nudism. So there is an element there, but it's not uh, at the core of their uh, concern. Um, also, um, Alan said she couldn't find another case on, on nudism. I did, I did find one case reached in 2005, which involved some grandparents, and the question about whether grandparents could care for children who were nudists. The grandparents promised they wouldn't be nude in front of the children. They might carry on nudist activities separately for the children. And the, the court at that point very quickly said, oh, in that case, this, this issue will be ignored. It's not a, it's not a concern. So there it seems, and it seems in W, the real uh, issue was the impact upon the child, that the child might be embarrassed by seeing nudism, rather than uh, the uh, social disapproval. Finally, it seems odd to me that it was the nudism case, the naturist cases that, that Helen chose, that you might think there are other cases of um, deviant behavior, I mean, the radicalization cases, you might see as an example of, of deviant parents. Uh, parents with very conservative religious views uh, might be seen as, as better examples of, of deviant parents uh, uh, in our society uh, to, today. Um, should there be uh, a presumption against deviant parents? It's interesting, as um, Helen goes through the three arguments that she gives for why um, she's concerned. Um, she looks at the, the, the we mustn't frighten the horses argument, the social isolation argument, the open future argument. What I think is striking about all three of those is it's not that she thinks those don't, aren't validly applied to deviant parents, but they should also, the same sorts of concerns should be applied to the uh, non-deviant parents. So, as Mavis said, the example of, uh, uh, I have a very good example of the contrast between being raised by uh, Jehovah's Witnesses and being raised within a community entirely of family lawyers. Um, uh, now, there's concerns with both groups being socially isolated, but her, her point is that you should, you should treat them both as raising concerns. Um, so, it's not that she thinks the arguments against the deviant parents don't have some validity, it's just they should equally apply to non-deviant uh, groups uh, as well. Towards the end of the article, um, perhaps there's a rather surprising point uh, at which Helen says she cannot proclaim the equal rights of all deviants to parent. Um, the article seems to be heading towards a conclusion that uh, there shouldn't be uh, any um, negative attitudes towards uh, deviant parents. Um, and she cannot agree with Bradley's quote that we have to be neutral about the value choices of members of society. Um, that would have been fascinating to know a little bit more about which categories of, of deviant parents uh, that she would think there would be some justification. Um, Here's my suggestion, although I suspect it's one that you <coughs> would be horrified uh, at. Um, and I draw on the article Charles Foster and I have written about two aspects of welfare that we see as key. One is the importance of relationships to the child, and the other is the, the importance of virtue. Um, and 
I wonder then what the law ought to be doing. It's not discriminating against deviant parents as such. I'm not sure any parent is deviant in themselves, but against deviant values. Um, and where the child is being raised in a way that promotes the child or within a community that promotes hatred of others, a disrespect <coughs> for others, a denial of the equal value of other people. Um, that those are values that should, that, that, that sort of upbringing should be seen as a deep one. Children should be raised to be open to finding relationships with a <coughs> wide range of people. Um, they should be open to value all uh, people. So perhaps a case like J and B with the orthodox, ultra orthodox Judaist, uh, Ju Judaism case, uh, where the children were going to be raised in a community which was uh, very opposed to uh, same-sex um, couples, very opposed to transsexual issues. Um, there, that seems to be properly described as a, uh, uh, as a deviant value. And the concern particularly there, and this is why being raised in a Jehovah's Witness family and a, a, a collective of family lawyers would matter. Um, I think, although you might be both closed in one sense, if you were a gay child or a trans child um, uh, being raised within the Jehovah's Witness community or being raised in an ultra-Orthodox Jewish community, your life will be very, very difficult. Um, if you are uh, uh, brought up by a group of family lawyers, hopefully it will be much less problematic. <laughs> So, I think then we need to move, maybe. So, I suggest perhaps it is right to have a presumption against deviant values, uh, and that the court should be uh, not wanting children raised in an environment that does not promote the equal value of all, does not encourage the child to seek out relationships with a wide range of people. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so I come to Helen's work as a sociologist rather than a lawyer, and um, you know, in this paper, as ever with Helen's work, I'm struck by the brilliance of her arguments, and also deeply worried that I miss many of the finer legal points. Um, but so what I'm going to do here is is talk about the about her work as it as it draws on uh, uh, sociology and the kind of areas of. Um, work that yeah, we, we shared to do with the study of uh, family life and, and parenting culture. Um, what always stood out about Helen's work was her deep appreciation of relationships, human relationships in general, and intimate relationships, and her understanding of the possibilities, but also the limitations of law in areas of intimate life. And I think this is really clear in relation to her work on positive parenting, um, her work on rape, her work on sex offenders and adoption. Um, I remember meeting her for a coffee I mean, several years ago. I was researching the vetting and barring scheme. And um, so I having a chat about that. She said, oh, I'm doing this paper on, on sex offenders and adoption. I'm, okay. <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, you know he Helen um, remains one of the cleverest and, and bravest people I've ever known um, in, in, in terms of her, in terms of her work and, and the, the way she was able to to really think and be very open-minded and go for the hard cases, I think, for Helen, because they really clarified um, issues in a way that the kind of lesser cases, which is more the kind of terrain that I work in, um, it, it didn't. So, you know, I was always a, a very big admirer of that. And I think it was Helen's appreciation of the nuances of intimate relationships that her critics often found quite difficult to comprehend and actually that they really objected to. Um, but also Helen's appreciation of legal principle um, didn't just allow her to be brave, I think it also encouraged her to be brave and very just in navigating the arguments that she was putting through. She didn't start from a presumption, she followed through the logic of where those arguments were taking, taking her and I think you can really see this at work in, in the, deviant, the article here on, on deviant parents. 
The article looks at continuities and changes in how deviant parents are framed in law, but also more widely in culture. Um, and it's not afraid to tackle the question, well, what should we do? As the mayor maybe just alluded uh, to that. Um, the continuities, well, Helen suggests that the idea is that the deviant parent still exists and that there still is a presumption against the deviant parent. But this idea has profoundly changed, not only in regard to the kind of parent who is considered deviant, i.e. no longer lesbian parents, um, now, you know, that, that's no, no longer deviant. But I think she's suggesting that the very idea of deviance itself has, has undergone um, a, a, a quite a profound ch a questioning. And this relates to a wider shift in the normative idea of the family. Um, I mean, in a, crudely, that no longer do we have the heterosexual 2.4 children as the norm. We now have a far greater acceptance of the diversity of family form. And again, we can see this in terms of the acceptance of, of lesbian parents as being absolutely fine. But whilst we have this, uh, we also have um, an increasingly, I think, conformist and prescriptive approach to family practices. Uh, the sociologist Val Gillis has described this as the shift in um, ideas about family, for, uh, uh, fa family function to the ideas about family competence that now, particularly in policy circles, um, the emphasis is not on what you look like as a family, you can be whoever you like, um, it's about what you do as parents. And this has become very, very kind of prescriptive. And Helen's work on positive parenting uh, really draws attention to this, this, this trend and also to what she describes as the pitfalls of the current moment, uh, where it all looks very nice. I mean, in fact, that's the, what she says in positive parenting, the injunction is to be nice. How could you argue against it? You couldn't say, oh, no, we should be saying be horrible. Yeah, the injunction is to be nice. But actually, um, this, is, this becomes a very kind of pres uh, prescriptive approach to the conduct of intimate relations within a family. And I think in, in looking at this kind of shift in, you know, away from uh, the idea that there, that there is a sort of deviance um, and you know, that looking at this, this kind of tension at the moment where you have on the one hand a, a kind of an open-mindedness about the kind of family and on the other hand some very prescriptive trends. I think Helen senses a trap. Um, I think that she, um, she sort of sees that the weakness of the normative framework of the family and the focus on the best interests of the child, it could express a greater tolerance of ways of being and doing family. And in a way, I think you can say it does. But in the current context, um, and looking at the deviant parents question as a, as a case study, I think yeah, we have to watch out for two perils. The first of which is moral relativism, and the second of which is identity politics. Um, so in terms of moral relativism, I mean, Helen's work, I think in this article, as always, is a call for tolerance and for imagination in thinking about family relationships. Helen's exhorting us to think what really matters when it comes to raising a child. At the end of the day, what really matters. But this isn't the same as saying, well, anything goes. <laughs> and partly, I think that's because not, every, not anything does go, as, as the other speakers have alluded to. I mean, Helen makes that point in the article about um, her awareness of how empirical research is infused with the genders, uh, that a kind of a culture of non-judgmentalism <coughs> normally contains judgment, even if it's not saying it. Um, and I think actually she's quite critical of Butler's loss and that, that the kind of idea that the problem in a, de a parent's deviance is how it might look, so it's not the behaviour itself, but how it might look to other people. That, I think, yeah, you know, she says is that that's an evasion of responsibility, if you like, an evasion of the, the making of a judgment um, ab about that behaviour itself. And there's a problem with the reluctance to make moral judgments, especially where legal judgments actually have to be made. Th this context can give legal judgments quite an arbitrary character. Um, so I think, you know, that, that, that's the kind of danger um, of a situation that looks like anything goes when that's really not the case, that there are judgments in there somewhere. But then we come to the question of identity politics. I mean, I've called it identity politics. I mean, Helen doesn't use that term in the article, but I think, I, I sort of feel that that's, that's how I understand what she's getting at. Um, 
Because it's the question of, well, well, should everything go? You know, I mean, do we really want something that is genuinely non-judgmental, where agendas don't exist if, if we had such a world? And I think by looking at the, the current discussion of deviant parents in relation to her earlier work on lesbian parents, I think she really draws out that tension very well. Um, because it's very important in this article, um, she reminds us, that, um, that the presumption uh, that lesbian parents were problematic was an equality issue, that that was why this was something to, 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 to really tackle, that this was a group of people who were denied the right to be parents because of their deviance. Um, regardless of the impact on the child, it was because there was a kind of uh, a, a, a presumption that their lifestyle behavior themselves was, was, a, was a problem. And this negative impact on the child was something that was presumed rather than proven. Um, but to say that people shouldn't be denied the right to be parents because they're considered deviant is not the same as saying that deviant parents should have the right to be a parent because they're deviant. That deviant parents are not an oppressed group. Different lifestyles or beliefs should not give somebody, say, extra points in the equality argument that people should be considered as parents by the same standard. Um, that question of what really matters when it comes to raising a child. And, and this is where I think Helen's call for imagination and caution um, is really, well, it, it just sums up her essential brilliance. I mean, imagination in the sense of a real genuine tolerance and openness to unusual lifestyles, beliefs, and practices. But caution in the sense that these issues shouldn't be marshaled as equality or discrimination issues when not otherwise warranted. I mean, I, I think what Helen's really kind of suggesting here is that moral judgments can be made and moral judgments should be made, but they must be made well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, I, thanks to you, all three of you. I'm clearly the interloper here because my connections with family law are fairly slight. Um, my first connection is that I've kept up with Helen's work since divorcing responsibly, and uh, that just because I thought it was a great book and uh, I enjoyed her style, and I felt that I shared her sensibility. And when I met her subsequently, I felt that even more. And it comes across also in this paper as I read it. I felt uh, an, an immediate sympathy with her general outlook. Um, I also though have a. Uh, Barrister, a family law barrister, uh, as my wife. And that allows me to say to Jonathan that the family law ap atmosphere in our household is very different from the <laughs> law atmosphere in his, his household. Uh, probably, uh, probably not as good in our household uh, if you practice uh, in uh, public care proceedings. You get to see some of the darker side of human nature and uh, you can't avoid uh, getting that across in your post-court reports. Um, so I, I, I agreed to do this mainly because I was uh, touched and um, honoured uh, to have the opportunity to say something in tribute of, uh, of Helen. Um, now, um, having said that, I, I'd like to ask a couple of questions about the paper that if she was here I'm sure Helen would have really taken pleasure in answering. She'd probably have given me a in my ear for not understanding well enough to begin with. Um, but um, they came up partly because of the title. Uh, so it was presented as a problem about a presumption. And much as I searched in the paper, I couldn't find any evidence that there is, was, or ever had been a presumption in operation in family law cases. But that may be because of the way I think of presumptions as devices for shifting burdens of proof and of adducing evidence, which are very prominent in criminal proceedings and to some extent in ordinary private litigation, but much less prominent in modern family law, where an inquisitorial model of, uh, of judicial work has come to predominate more. So I thought the word presumption was in that way rather misleading. So I struggled a little bit with the paper, trying to find out what it was that Helen thought um, was being, what the tool was that might be used against deviant parents uh, 
such that we should worry about it and inquire about its soundness. So at first I thought it was, um, it was a question mainly about toleration. And, and this, this was the passage towards the beginning of the paper that made me think that. Private family law disputes over which parent the child should live with offer a particularly clear window onto what judges see as deviant. This is because there, these are cases where the family has invited the law inside. Judges do not therefore have the option that's available in most other legal disputes of adopting the liberal stance that people's deviance falling short of criminality is of no interest or relevance to the law. So I suppose that the reason why that initial characterization of the problem struck me as being a problem about toleration was because it sounded very much like Helen was invoking the idea that was so popular in the 60s and 70s that dominated the Williams Committee report about there being uh, areas where the law should um, resist censure, <coughs> should not let its own voice become a voice of uh, harsh criticism, um, should not, not in particular criminalize, and we might say by analogy, take people's children away uh, as if a penalty for uh, wrong behavior. <coughs> so that, that was how I took the problem um, to be framed. I, I wasn't entirely sure in that passage whether Helen had come up with a pretty convincing uh, reason uh, why um, this area, the area of private family law disputes concerning children, was a particularly uh, useful place to study tolerance. It didn't strike, strike me as obvious because she, she had the idea that um, the, the, the model case of intolerance was criminalization and that a liberal principle would be one that didn't care about deviance other than criminal behavior, but as somebody who's also interested in tort law and contract law, I was immediately drawn to thinking about cases where, the, where private law cares enormously about non-criminal uh, deviance, like people who earnestly want to have the best swimming pool in their neighborhood mm -hmm. and insist on having the badly made swimming pool torn down very wastefully uh, in order to have it rebuilt exactly to their crazy specifications which the courts rightly say is an unreasonable waste, and they should be ashamed of themselves. It's not criminal, <laughs> but, but the question is, who should pay for that? Uh, why should it be, why should such a huge wasteful endeavor be, be both paid for by the builders and sponsored by the state? That's a very good question about toleration, arises in private law. And so I did wonder, as I was initially framing this paper as a paper about toleration, why it would be thought that private childcare disputes gave rise to special problems of toleration, I suppose I was beginning to think, well, it might be like this, that uh, it's not just like a contract dispute, a zero-sum game, there's the third party. And uh, if we, we already know if we tolerate the uh, crazy uh, interests of the defendant, we'll end up with the plaintiff paying for it and vice versa in a contract case or a tort case. But in a, in a childcare case, we've got to also ask whether the child will be paying for it, and maybe we shouldn't be too tolerant uh, on behalf of a child um, why should we impose a degree of tolerance on the child that we might not have wished for ourselves as children? So there may be some issue there, and I, I was interested in that. But as, as I read on in the paper, I began to think it wasn't about toleration at all. So and this is uh, really my, my puzzle for us to discuss, perhaps. Um, because gradually it seemed to be more about um, a non-discrimination norm. By, by the next page, Helen was talking about whether deviance, as she understood it, should qualify as an important factor to be put into the balance. And that's a different picture. Should it count? Should it be disregarded? So we know in race discrimination law, race should be disregarded. In <coughs> sex discrimination law, sex should be disregarded. In deviance discrimination law, deviance should be disregarded. That sounds like the kind of proposal it is now. And then the question becomes the one that's raised at the end, and it was raised by my colleagues, of just how far the protection of deviance should stretch, which deviant groups should benefit from the non-discrimination rule. So that was my next interpretation of it. And then by the end, I had another interpretation again on page <laughs> 20, um, because this was where Helen said it, or said, actually she asked rhetorically, whether it's not a very purpose of the judiciary to protect the rights of unpopular minorities. And that's neither about toleration nor about discrimination. That's about the accommodation of uh, people who are otherwise invisible or disregarded, and whose plight is therefore not taken seriously enough. And far from suggesting that um, the deviant states is of no interest or relevance to the law, 
that formulation suggests that the law should be paying close attention to it and protecting deviant uh, parents. And that's a stronger position. And that's quite different from not paying attention to deviants. So that, that's my first um, line of investigation into the paper. Uh, it's not about presumptions. Is it about toleration? Is it about discrimination? Or is it about accommodation? So the second um, uh, set of puzzles that I had about the paper um, were connected with, if you like, let's, let's just, for simplicity, just think of it for a moment as an anti-discrimination program. It says, don't count deviance against people. And now let's discuss which kinds of deviance we mean. Let's just think about it that way. Uh, so what does it mean to count deviance against somebody? So sometimes it sounded like the worry was that the court itself was finding something deviant and objecting to it. And, and that clearly from the earlier examples that Mavis read out was something that the courts once <coughs> did about lesbian parents. The court itself found uh, the practices or the way of life objectionable and it was, it was, it was going to say so. And it was, it was that that was going to be counted against the parent. But, and then there's some of that in the, in the paper, but then there are <coughs> other things that might be <coughs> objectionable that the court, well, not even objectionable in one case. There, there's, there's this, you might, it might be thought objectionable to make other people anxious, even unjustifiably. So some of the examples are examples where um, the other parent has concerns about the uh, way of life of the uh, deviant parent, and the worry of the courts is not the deviance, but the apprehension of its dangers by the other parent, or by other carers or guardians. Um, and Lady Justice Butler's loss said, she spelled out, the concerns may or may not be justified, but they will be there, and since they are there, they must be recognized. And I thought to myself, well, wait, wait a minute, why must they, right? They're wrong, perhaps. Shouldn't we ask whether the concerns are the right concerns? And this made me think about a general problem in ethics that I encounter a lot in other parts of my work, which is the question of the extent to which uh, we should uh, rate as a reason a pain or a pleasure that's irrational. And it comes up a lot. So somebody takes pleasure in tearing the wings off flies. That's quite repugnant. Uh, I, I can't see any reason to take pleasure in that. They take pleasure. So some people, writing about that kind of example, say, well, since they take pleasure in it, that's a plus. Others say, taking pleasure in it, that just makes it worse. <laughs> right? So you can see there there's an interesting divergence of views about how pleasures and pains should be counted. And the same arises here. Uh, when <coughs> father says, I don't like the fact that they're nudists, you never know. Right? Uh, should we meet father with the robust response, yeah, we hear you, but that's quite wrong. Uh, there are no concerns. You're, you're just, you're, your mind is le playing tricks on you. It's leading you into wild thoughts. Uh, or should we say, yeah, yeah, okay, that's, a, that's it's definitely a negative about their behavior that you hate it. Yeah? I think that's a very interesting theme in the paper. And I, I, of course, I didn't feel that Helen ended up taking a totally definite view on <coughs> that. But that's always the great thing about Helen's work is she doesn't have to. Uh, because you always feel that you've got it, and that she's seen it, and uh, that she's testing you to see if you can uh, if you can navigate that terrain with her. So that, that brings me to the third way of reading um, what her what the ground of discrimination is, and this was also something that came up quite a bit, but differently in Lady Justice Butler Sloss's remarks. Sometimes she seems to be talking about the inadvisability, not the objectionability, but the inadvisability or the unwisdom of refusing to compromise about something in the face of another litigant's anxieties. All right? The sincerely held views of others who are shocked by. It wasn't about whether we should pander to those mistaken views, or let alone whether the court should pander. It was about the wisdom of a litigatory strategy. Okay? It arises everywhere in the law. Um, if you want to settle your case and avoid the often excessive costs of prolonged litigation, the best thing to do is to compromise. And Helen presents this in on one of her occasions as a problem, what she calls the pull to the middle. 
And so here's a problem in one way, but not in another. And another is the solution. Uh, because litigation is partly a spur to compromise. And uh, if people are caught in the middle, then they're coming out a bit less divided. And that, one hopes, leads to better prospects for um, shared parenting and uh, other aspects of the ongoing relationship. So that could be about the wisdom of the attitude that the, that in this case, let's say mother, is taking to father. Uh, the resistance, the, the, the view that nudism is forever, uh, whatever her husband thinks about it, uh, that can be inflammatory. And some of the remarks of the Justice about this last week, we think that's just what she's saying. She's just saying, look guys, as judges in family cases must and do, uh, could you please go and sort this out and stop being so intransigent? Uh, so some of it seems to me not really to be about the court taking a view on what was objectionable, or even about the court taking a view on what other people could object to, but just take the court taking a view on what would be a good litigation resolution strategy. So I wasn't sure that all of these examples lined up as examples of the same kind of discrimination, raising the same kind of issue. I thought the most philosophically troubling cases were the ones where the court was um, seemed to be saying that the uh, irrational fears uh, should be counted as valid. Well, my middle category. I thought that was very worrying on a general issue. I don't know what the answer is, but I tend to be of the, I, I'm predisposed to the view that we should call people on their mistaken views and not pander to them. So I'm naturally drawn to the view that when uh, dad thinks that naturism is sexually dangerous, we should give him a verbal slap and tell him to get real. Uh, but you know, I, I can see how there might be a debate about that. Um, uh, but my, I had a sort of worry, finally, about how all that connected up with uh, another aspect of the scope of the paper. So towards the beginning, Helen says that she's going to try and uh, focus her attention on what she called freestanding deviance. Uh, I thought that was very curious because it didn't turn out to be true in the rest of the paper. Freestanding deviance was the case of deviance that didn't harm the child. That was how I heard it. So she gave the contrasted example of deviance in the form of child sexual abuse. Uh, sorry, an extremely contrasting example. That that would be, um, that would be not freestanding deviance, in her sense. And she said, oh, it's difficult to draw the line between freestanding and not freestanding. But I thought it became more and more difficult to draw the line as the paper went on. I thought most of the deviants turned out to be not freestanding. That's to say, in as much as the courts were themselves taking a dim view of it or pandering to those who did, it was mainly because they regarded it as not freestanding. They thought that the child's interests were in one way or another going to be affected, or that at least it was debatable whether the child's interests were going to be affected. And um, it made me think towards the end, towards the very end of the paper, that um, uh, in a way, the question of deviance uh, dissolved into the question of the best interests of the child. It turned out that almost everything that was about the best interests of the child could be understood as a question of what was deviant. And so in the end, we are thrown back into thinking, well, is liberal parenting best? Or should we go for parenting with lots of discipline? How about parents who don't let their children speak? Isn't that the best thing for them? Mm -hmm. and I, so I, and I, I kind of thought, well, it, it came to a head that when um, uh, Helen, towards the end, on page 17 this was, uh, she drew a particular contrast. A child raised by deviance, she said, cannot fail to be well aware of normality all around them. A child raised to accept conventional social values. And tra tra I can't remember what the rest of the quote says, but the contrast was what I was interested in, between a child raised by deviance and a child raised to accept conventional social values. Because where I come from, it's deviant to bring a child up to accept conventional social values. <laughs> right? I spent all my time telling my kids to wear what they like, Stop kowtowing to other people's opinions of them. Stop worrying about what other parents think of them or what their friends think of them. Stop being so conventional. So I, was, I thought by the end of the paper, there was an interesting twist, which was that what Helen had tended to show was that um, it was a sort of deconstruction of the original problem. Uh, and I thought it was just kind of typical. Uh, and I, I could just think of her uh, um, as I read it, um, uh, that in a way she had deconstructed her original problem. She'd shown that uh, the, the problem of uh, 
deciding what counts as deviance for the purposes of her original question dissolved into the question of what counts as good parenting. And so the, the topic that she had written about many other times, the topic of what counts as the best interest of the child, uh, was the real uh, topic of the paper again. Um, and I thought that was brilliant. And it was done so smoothly and beautifully and deceptively. And uh, it made me think about a hundred thousand things that I hadn't thought about before. And of course, that was uh, what, what we all uh, love most about Dear Helen's work and what we miss most of all about, uh, about not having her here to tell us where we've gone wrong. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks to all four of you. I think it was a really excellent um, coming from Bill's page.
I mean, isn't it the case that she probably approves of the judgment of Butler's loss in Ray W? Thank you. Ellie? Um, what the paper made me think about most was um, nonconformity um, and issues of conformism and nonconformity uh, and how that shifts in history. Um, what it constitutes and what it means. Um, and I thought that where she began in some of her discussion of Howard Becker, outsiders, and the recognition that really once Becker had argued what Becker did, nobody could anymore um, not say we really like nonconformists. I mean, who, who wants to be a conformist, right? Mm -hmm. Nobody. And nobody could say that anymore. Um, from the 1970s onwards, um, because that's completely square, um, that's completely boring, um, and there's just a recognition by that point in time, because everything has happened by then, which Becker's work grew on, I mean specifically the 60s, uh, where so much has been put up to challenge uh, that you couldn't really argue for conformism um, in any kind of convincing way anymore. And there has to be a concession that um, things that are alternative or things that are different um, has something going for them. I think the thing that's happened though, which is why I think some of Jenny's comments are interesting in the wider issues that Helen's work raises here and that it always raised, um, is where nonconformism now finds its expression and the problems that then creates for both the law and for the wider society. So broadly speaking, I think the problem that we've got now is that certainly compared to, say, the 19th century, when there were the great non-conformist movements, which sought to socially challenge, say, religious authority through putting forward a different kind of idea um, of what the individual should mean and what we should mean in relation to the society. These days, if people want to be non-conformist, they do it in a much more individualised, lifestyle-oriented way. So the way we express our dislike of the way things are um, is just to behave differently in some sort of way um, within the fairly narrow limits of our own lifestyle. Um, and what then happens, I think, is because there's no wider serious social debate about the order of things and what genuine nonconformism could mean, these forms of nonconformism then become subject to moral opprobrium. And things that are actually relatively harmless in and of themselves, like John says, that somebody might want to express their non-conformism through how they raise their children unconventionally, uh, which actually at the end of the day isn't going to challenge anything about a social order. I mean, even if nudists think that they're really controversial people that are going to overthrow, you know, the existing social relations, I mean, that's just barking, you know. <laughs> walking around in the nude isn't going to make any difference to existing social relations. You should be walking around in the nude. You know, having a bath with your kids in the nude isn't going to make any damn difference to anything. It's just having a bath with your kids in the nude. So it's at that level completely socially neutral. People who are into it and present it as something more than that, um, have got a wrong-headed view of what it means to be non-conformist, but actually that's all they're doing. I think that the problem that exists at the moment, and I think this is the danger that Helen always was alerting us to, is that when the law misinterprets those things um, and sees them as more than they are, then what it does is create a new problem, which is the invasion of our privacy, the invasion of our right to do silly things and think silly things, which we all have the absolute right to do. And in that sense, we all have the right to bring up our kids in the maddest way we might think possible and to give that um, silly social consequences if we want to, even though that might not be true. And I believe that to be the case. And the law acts against that at its peril because it just shouldn't go there. I think the problem as well is that if those things come to be misinterpreted and seen as more than they are, then what happens is the continuing reinforcement of the absence of genuine nonconformity. Because genuine nonconformity can never exist simply at the level of individual attributes, lifestyle, or how we raise our children. You know, and actually some of the most nonconformist people can be the most conservative in their personal lives. Um, and I think that that's you know, it's that kind of balance of the social, the personal, and the legal, which Helen always brought to light in her work, um, because she always brought broader thinking um, to it all.
I was going to say um, that I thought um, it was very appropriate that someone with a sociolo uh, sociology background was here because actually, as Ellie's just said, um, for, I don't know how she did it, but Helen always managed to bring sociology issues into the law and by using the law and sticking very firmly to legal concepts and, and looking at the cases and drawing out um, you know, what those cases did and how they represent society today. Um, and I thought it was very interesting, the point you made about um, that there was no presumption of deviance, because for me, the, the most interesting point she drew out, which I don't think anyone ever does when they look at legal cases, is she said, why can't we have, you know, what about the presumption of normal? Because, because there's a presumption of normal, there is a presumption of deviance. And that's the point she's making, I think, in the thing. So um, the point John made at the beginning of, um, you know, there is a presumption that if you're a naturist and you get in the bath with a child, that you're going to ch abuse that child. That's, I think, what was kind of running through the paper for me. Um, and I thought that was a really, really powerful point. Because I think in the law, often, um, you know, the judge will go to a case with a, a presumption, a definition of deviance or whatever, and take that presumption and apply it to a case. Um, and I think one of the reasons why um, uh, Helen always um, was very, very anti the best inter interest of the child concept is because you have two fighting parents, particularly in the case where it's about custody, two fighting parents with different ways of wanting to live their lives, bring up their children, who then hand over that decision to someone else, a professional, in the best interest of the child. So that then takes someone coming into a family where there's already arguments, having to impose a moral agenda on that family. And one of the, the reasons why I was, I was going to say that I think what she did, which was really powerful in her writing, and where she brings the sociology in is one of the things that's very, very key. And I work in um, education, so we, you know, look at um, uh, uh, children's um, abuse of children and, and how that is actually becoming widened more and more. And it got me thinking about the legal concepts of mens rea and actus reus because actually, you know, really, sh should it not be the case that unless something is done wrong to the child? that you know, there should be a presumption that the equal weight is given to either parent. Um, so you're talking about the act. And when you look at the question of child abuse, you know, it's, you were talking about anxiety, you're talking about all these concepts of a potential hurt or harm to the child, not, not an actual harm to the child by um, the way that the, 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 the parents um, uh, are bringing up the children or who's going to have the child. And um, you know, should we not pull back and maybe this is what she's alluded to, pull back and say, you know, who can afford to just provide? You know, is it a question of behaviour at all? Um, it, it has gone from the concept of equality to right down to the concept of, um, of behaviour. Thank you. Thank you very much follows on from that. Um, I was very interested in this idea of um, deviance as a fluid concept and particularly how deviance is then defined against the concept of a good parent um, and as our ideas in society, if not in the law, our ideas change about um, what the good parent is, how this might then have a knock-on effect on the definitions of a deviant parent. And um, just a couple of examples, I'm not a lawyer, I've, I've got to confess, so I'm not sure where these examples stand legally, but just two things from the news that have struck me recently. Um, so one issue is this idea of um, parents <coughs> taking their children out of, whole, out of school during term times for holidays. Um, you know, is this now seen as an example of, of deviance that, um, is that seen as an example of a deviant parent if you take your children out of school? Um, and the other one was uh, the issue of, um, I think it was in Yorkshire, uh, a parent who expressed a controversial remark about bottle feeding and the children were taken into care. And again, would that now be classed as deviance and how this shifts the definition not just of deviant behaviour but um, broadens the definition of harm to the child. So if you express a controversial view about bottle feeding or take your children on holiday, it's not just you who's being a deviant behaviour, but this is now being reinterpreted as actually causing harm to the
the child. Um, so I'm just wondering if this kind of points us in new directions of um, deviance, and, and it does suggest that there is a presumption against a deviant parent. Hi, yeah, I was, I was interested in this paper in, in, in this article about sort of the role of deviance within the context of a contested residence dispute. She was surely in a contested residence dispute. You've got two parents putting themselves up against each other. But surely the first measure is of the par parents' relative deviance against each other. And then the, 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 the measure against the social view is sort of being used as, as a sort of check to see who is being the most unreasonable. And I think in that sense, deviance could really be used on, on both sides because you're kind of using it um, to explain perhaps disapproval of the other parent um, or a refusal to change behaviour. So are you are you disapproving of the other parent because they are legitimately taking a very questionable lifestyle choice? Or on the other hand, is your disapproval of the other parent somehow more excusable because you're part of a small subgroup in society with particularly conservative views? And that might be a reason for why you hold these wrong-headed views about the other parent. So I thought it was interesting that this idea of deviance could be used on both sides to explain why parental behaviour seems unreasonable, perhaps is either more unreasonable or less unreasonable depending on how this, this deviance plays out. So I thought that was interesting, so this idea of how it's measured against each other first, and then how so being measured in society plays into the kind of decision that the court is making. Yeah, Thanks. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not a family lawyer at all. I'm just a fan. Um, but uh, so forgive me if I get it wrong. But I was struck by something that Professor Herring said because I had exactly the same worry when reading this paper initially that sure about deviant values. I think your point was where surely you should draw some kind of line where the deviancy exists consists of telling the children or raising the children to believe that other people are inferior or somehow not worthy. And, um, and we had a short email exchange on this with Helen, and I, just to paraphrase, her point was, I think, don't worry too much about this. There are lots of people raising their children in a ways that suggest that, other people, that they are better than others. And her example was one of the English example of the aristocracy, um, which I thought was a great example and might be helpful, because it then finally puts you to thinking more broadly about how certain liberal values also consists of a general sense that we are the tolerant ones and other people are not. So that was, you know, partly by, by way of response to that on very similar words that, that I have. Thank you. Daniel. Thank you. Uh, just a quick response to some of the things that have been said that uh, spoke my mind. When we talk about law, earlier you talk about law shouldn't go there, I think the problem with these cases is that the parents have gone to law, so law has to go there, and it's between two parents. And I think that troubles a position which talks about law shouldn't go there, it doesn't have to make those decisions. Uh, Felicity, I had exactly the same idea about who would be the deviant parents there, who would be the, uh, the mark trying to prevent contact. It was obvious that deviancy, I think what Helen's going to be useful is it provides a tool to apply that and actually applying the deviancy framework to that actually seems to be fruitful. Sorry. But the question I've got is for Jonathan, um, because towards the end of your paper, and I agree with you at the end of your, uh, your comments when you're saying that um, who are the bad deviants then, and what, who would have to describe that the bad deviants now, it's really interesting to find it, because I think it's really important and telling, as you also I think identified, that she makes that point very clearly that she's not on the side of all the Indian parents, that's not what she's saying. I think that comes over very clear. I think it's a really important sort of a turn in the paper at one point where you can see kind of agonizing. There's a real problem there. I think she'd like to be on the side of the Indian parents, but she, you know, there was a sense where I think Hannah would often sort of not want to be sitting. She always criticized me for sitting on the fence, but, <laughs> uh, and at the time she would, but I didn't think she was as comfortable there as I am. So I think she would really <laughs> think <laughs> she didn't want to be there. I think in some ways they were. But when you give your example of, and you give your example there of the child, um, the gay or the trans child suffering, being brought up in this terribly intolerant family, the case you referred to is interesting because actually, in that case, it's not the child that's trans, it's the parent that's mm. trans parent. And I thought it was really interesting, was it a slip of yours that you were 
because in defending the welfare principle, it's easier to get where you want to go when it's the child that gets game trans. But it's not so easy to get where you want to go in terms of all of that political openness and labor framework where it's the parent that is the trans parent and the family against it. And in that context, where I think this paper is right, and I agree with John, I think what it comes down to is basically saying there's the inadequacy of, of the paramount principle. Because I think we've grown to run back to saying it's the child's interest, and we've got this poor suffering queer kid who's got no parents. Welfare can help us there. But where there's really clear evidence that they will suffer if they're contact with transparent, then you've got to get out of the trap of welfare. And precisely then, I think that's what the paper's about there. So, that's why I was troubled on that. Can, can I just come, come, come back? Yes. Yes. And you said that the child in that case was trans. We don't know. Oh, okay. We have yes, no idea. Yeah. No, and, yeah. and so and the court didn't them. even ask that. The, right. the court just assumed the child yes. was cis. And, yes. and just said, oh, therefore, the, the, it'll, it'll be all right. And I think that, that, was, that, was, that was what was, that was the, the worry there. They, they assumed the child would be, would be heterosexual and, and, and cis and didn't even question it. Um, and that, that then, uh, as you said, that's, that's I think the, the trouble with it. But can you only then get to where you want to go by talking about the possibility of the child being gay or trans? Surely if it really doesn't matter, as we would agree it doesn't matter whether the gay is trans or whatever, then we need something beyond looking at the welfare of that child. And that's what you can't but do in that. But you see, I, I would say e even if even if the child isn't, if the child is brought up to have values which are not respectful of people who are not cis heterosexual, that's harmful. That's harmful to be brought up with that set of values. That, that's a much bigger. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think it's a very interesting paper as a lens, to think about the lens of deviance. And I agree very much with John about the construction of the case and how actually it's interesting to think about how Helen's paper mirrors the construction of a case. So deviance is brought into the argument in W or in the old lesbian cases by the father who wouldn't normally, certainly in the 70s, and even in, in, uh, in W, he wouldn't be the carer of these children because he hasn't been the carer of the children and we know normally everything goes on status quo. So he's actually, he or his lawyer, and it's almost certainly his lawyer, not him, is having to construct an argument to minimise the capacity of the, the mother to be the carer by contrasting her so-called deviant behavior with his behavior. So it's also, as May says, it's about comparisons. So when we, if, if there is a presumption or anything, if deviance comes in, deviance becomes a new tool, a new set of arguments to be used to challenge somebody who would otherwise be seen as an okay parent. And this case would never arise if both the parents had the proclivity or whatever word you like to do, because they wouldn't be disputing. They might be disputing about the care of the child, but they wouldn't be able to challenge one against the other. So it's actually how about divide and rule, I think, and about how lawyers have faced the really difficult problem of applying the best interest test um, without an understanding of how you can really know what's better for children, if that is a possible thing ever to do, and I think Helen would say it isn't, but actually we're looking for very simple tropes. And in that, deviance became in the 70s, a simple trope, you're a lesbian, you're out. And um, we can tell whether you're a lesbian, we can actually, I mean, I had a client, I remember, who had, was accused of being a lesbian by her separated husband. And um, the only evidence he seemed to have was that she, was, she had moved out from his house 
into sharing with the Lady Gaines teacher. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
that was her presumption, that we don't know where things end up. And you know, the, the beauty of intimacy is that it takes us in all kinds of, of directions. Thank you. So I'm conscious that if any of you want to come in, do, do say. Um, well, I notice on page 20, towards the end, Helen says this, I do not believe that all deviants are oppressed minorities in need of liberation. I cannot proclaim the equal right of all deviants to parent. And that, that struck me as a very profound sentence, which was possibly a way in to one of the issues that I think Helen's grappling with here, and that is that we are no longer concerned with equal rights in society. I don't think Helen would go this far, but I think she, she recognises that the old battles for equal rights have been won. And that ra therefore raises the question, what moral framework do you use to resolve conflicts between parents? Um, you can't rely upon the old answers that progressive people would have used in the 70s and the 80s. Uh, and I suppose there's various answers to that question, one, one of which is, is to say, well, we should recognise the right of parents to parent. Well, that, I agree with that, but that only really gets you so far, because as, as Daniel said, the, the problem with these cases that Helen's grappling with is, well, you've got parents who have gone to court, and you've got a, a deviant parent. How does the court resolve those com competing demands? Um, and and I'm, not, I'm not a practitioner in family law, but I can't help thinking that what judges increasingly do these days is try and apply an equality framework in circumstances where, in reality, the battle for equality has been won. And what that schools them to do is to celebrate, if you like, difference, to instinctively take the stand or the side of the person who is a minority, simply because that person is a minority. Because in days of old, if you'd been a minority, you'd have been oppressed, and therefore the, the claim for equal rights would have meant the law should have been on your side to balance things out. That's no longer the case, but that framework is, is still being applied. And I wondered if actually Helen almost um, supported that approach when she says, um, for is it not a very purpose of the judiciary to protect the rights of unpopular minorities? Well, she asks it as a question. Uh, I would say, no, it's not. Um, because just because you're a minority, it doesn't mean that you have any moral claim. In fact, there may often be a good reason why you're in a minority. You know, I'm not saying there is, all I'm saying is you just simply cannot use the framework of equality to resolve these questions. And I, and I can't help thinking if um, that's possibly one of the problems that we have these days. I mean, Je Jenny said, look, there's a danger of moral relativism. There certainly is that danger. But I, I suppose what I'm trying to get at is, what is the moral framework that we now use to resolve these questions? I think the equality framework is wrong and it's very dangerous. Um, but what is the answer? Is it possibly that we should focus more generally on the needs of society? I just wanted to throw something into the mix and I'll take a couple round of the table. But does it harm a child to um, be against trans people? You know, um, should a child be removed because um, the parents are very anti trans? You know, does it harm a child to be. Brexit here? Do they charm a child to, you know, have very strong views about something? Um, children, and, th and this is a question about whether a child is a blank slate or not, you know, should a court be deciding whether a, a parent's strong views are at harm to the child and a good reason to remove a child or to grant custody to the more liberal parent? We do do that in some contexts, like the uh, radicalisation case. <coughs> their parents because there's a risk of radicalisation. Very case that the president decided last year or the year before. So sometimes they could do do that. And is that but, reasonable? But the question, question is, well, that's, a, that's, that's an interesting question in itself. <laughs> but the, well, I, where I was going to go to Jonathan's um, discussion earlier, that we only really care about these kind of cases in the private law concept that the parents have taken it to law. We don't think that the state should step in because you're uh, an orthodox Jew. We don't think the state should step in because you're a lesbian family, going back to those older cases. And that's the, that's the interesting tension between our public law and private law context, where the law does or doesn't care. And, and your follow-up question as well, which is a very good one, but the reason why it's not caring. But Thank you. Peter. Um, it works kind of on, uh, and the response to the point of the case of John's here. Uh, so to follow from 
John Holbrook's point, that it, isn't it the case that between Helen's article on the Paramount Principle in 96 and this article, the old moral order in so far as it applied to family life disintegrated as, a, as an institutionalized affair, or the political support for the now outrageous views expressed about lesbian parents in the 1970s disappeared in about that time frame. So that, so that there is no, I mean, and here I am a criminal lawyer, so I'm now going to adapt something that I've observed in the criminal field about antisocial behaviour and how we construct legal behaviour in that field and see if it works. I'm not a family lawyer, so I could be wrong, but I'm interested. So in the criminal law, what used to be regarded as um, morally wrong, well, when we were worried about dangerous people, like vagrants of the centuries, we had vagrants who were dangerous people. We constructed that dangerous and moral wrongdoing. They were morally inferior. Whereas now, what, in our social behaviour law, we swapped over, and what's morally wrong is that which is dangerous. And so I just wonder whether the parallel works here that our difficulty with identifying deviance is because where before deviance would have been seen as a risk to the welfare of the child, and therefore Paramount's principle would have operated in that way, now we look for risks to the welfare of the child, and that's, devi that's what we call deviance. Precisely the, the effect of the paramount principle is to redefine the terms in which we understand deviance. They have been, in the old sense, demoralised. We've taken out moral order, we've taken out moralism, uh, and we've re uh, replaced this harm. It, in fact, it is the same principle, because it's the harm principle in family law, which is for the best in welfare of children. So that, so that that creates the difference. Now, difficulty with, a, with grasping what's deviant and what's not, and um, and it's subject still, that point that, that, that norm deviance is disintegrated into the parental principle itself is subject to Helen's earlier strictures. That then becomes a great uh, cover for all kinds of determinant policy considerations that then smuggle in in terms of well, what's in the best interest of the child. That could be all sorts of things. For example, the radicalisation cases being examples. Ooh, they're conservative Muslims. They might vaguely be involved in some possible radicalisation down the line of their children who might go to Syria might become terrorists. But since there's a risk there, we've identified the risk, we've got deviance. And that that's one of the difficulties with this subject, is that swap, that shift from a moral, from preventing harm based on moralism to constructing our moral order based on preventing harm. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, sort of almost amplify that point and apply it more generally. I think there's a sense in which the sort of million stranded liberalism has become a victim of its own success, you know? Uh, the harm principle really caught on. It's astonishing that something written by a philosopher and a <laughs> should be so powerful. But so powerful that uh, there's a great temptation, isn't there, to um, find harms and to simplify causation in such a way as to not need the harms to be properly investigated. And that's harmful. But wait a minute, it could go the other way, you know? Children who are brought up with parents who are really anti-trans, who knows? They're going to be rebelling, aren't they? Pretty soon. Mm -hmm. Let's hope they do. You know. So, uh, the, and, but you know, there's a very great tendency just to shorten causal chains and to treat the harm principle as being uh, satisfied. And, and you might say, well, that's perverse because we originally thought the harm principle was a way of containing that tendency to be aggrieved and to complain and then to suppress and forbid. And in a way, I think it might have. Out Lord Devlin, Lord Devlin, now. Uh, we'd be better off with the old Devlin ways. We said, well, wait until it's immoral, please. Which was a good, a, a good separate limiting principle, right? So I think that's just a, a, a really just the point at large. Yeah? Did you want to say something there? Yes, I mean, sort of following that, in relation to your now famous example, I mean, there is a tyranny of open mindedness. I mean, that is, you know, this sort of sense that the, the idea that you need to kind of promote the virtues of open-mindedness to a child, and that is going to be better. I'm thinking, you're, you know, yeah, the, the idea that a family, a liberal family of lawyers, would give, uh, you know, a gay child or a trans child a kind of more a better time than um, a more, uh, I don't know, narrow-minded family. Um, it, it does contain <coughs> within it a lot of the um, uh, the problems that I think Helen's cautioning against in this, doesn't it? And that's why you end up in this sort of mess of judgments that don't look like judgments or refusal to judge becoming um, a problem in its own way. I, I, I think we've seen too many suicides of gay and trans children raised in oppressive environments to, 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 to take that rather easy response. Yeah. 
Well, I'm not sure if it's an easy response. Okay, we've got three more people who want to speak. I suggest we take those three questions mm -hmm. and then, or comments, and then if anybody wants to say something again, then we'll go upstairs. So I think you were next. Yeah. Thanks. Um, it's reminding me of the last time that I saw Helen when she told us she was writing a paper about Delia. And what she then uh, started to raise with the example that she mentioned a little bit in this paper was Jehovah's Witnesses. And I think really what's interesting to me listening to the response to the paper, I think the paper is brilliant, but um, is the it's interesting that she didn't choose that, but that as her as her main example in, in the paper, which I think is for the uh, reason that uh, people have said that the uh, nudity uh, example that the nakedness is uh, brings to life in, in a sense much more clearly a lot of her points. But I also think that uh, the, the point about Jehovah's Witnesses, in a way, is that it's, it's almost that they are uh, the non-conformists of today, the religious people are the non-conformists of uh, today. Um, and that, in a sense, is then she's defending that non-conformity of the modern era. And she's saying, I think what, what was always great about Helen is that she really understood the importance of private life and of the um, model of messiness of private life, and that that can take many, many forms. At the same time, she, did, she didn't um, see an overdetermination of the adult that resulting from that bringing of the child in the private life. And so her point is that no matter uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, they will meet other people. Do you know, the children that are being brought up in that environment will meet other people in the world and they will be influenced by other people. So we shouldn't be too uh, narrow in our expectation of what's uh, what's going, you know, what the young adult that comes from the child is going to turn out like. And I think that, to me, it's that combination of the, uh, the kind of importance of the private and yet the relationship of the private to the, the world around, which uh, she really understood and made very clear and, and therefore cautioned us constantly that we need to uh, kind of defend the private and, and make sure that that is of help. So that comes completely um, leads me. What I want to say in terms of the frame of thinking about this, which is the right to respect for private and family life, that's the starting point. And what really troubles me about the deviance argument is that we're dealing here, as Helen says, with cases that the criminal law is not interested, the public law is not interested. We've only got here because the two parents have brought the case themselves, one of them has brought the case to court. And there seems to be sort of a spectrum of completely <coughs> furious silly objections to the other parents' parenting, to something that we can start calling or alleging to be deviance, through to something which is actually positive harmful to the child. Now, criminal law and public law would say, until you get here, we're, we're just not going there. Yeah. So my point is, why on earth should private law be allowed to play in this much more nebulous field? of deviance. Now, yes, some deviance will be harmful, and maybe that's what Helen means when she says, I'm not going to defend the <coughs> parents to parent, because clearly sexually abusing the children is deviant and deeply harmful, and nobody wants that. Mm -hmm. So it's this non-harmful non deviance, or um, sort of, oh, you know, maybe there's harm because the stepfather's having a bath with his nine-year-old stepchild. If you want to make an allegation that this child is positively at risk of sexual abuse, please say that and evidence that, and then we'll listen to that argument. I'm not sure we should be entertaining, but private law should be entertaining these more diffuse, mm, deviance. <laughs> <laughs> that with that example, fact. though, the, the objection yeah. might be there's a risk of sexual abuse, but it might be this is immodest <coughs> or this is just a improper. Well, it is a sort of argument that but it's meant the public law threshold. Yeah. I'm just not saying what the basis is, the justification is for interfering with that parent's right to respect the private yeah. family lives as, yeah. you know, as manifested by their parenting. Yeah. We have a an allegation of harm. Which is not to say that harm is not equally capable of being a value driven, nebulous, around the edges concept. Alison. <coughs> This is not a completely foreign thought, but it comes from much of what everybody has been saying. And I, 
I think I'm less sanguine about accepting that being and doing family is now so open and wonderful and the law and society will accept any way we want to live and, and that you know, equality has been achieved. And I'm wondering whether the deviant, remember deviance is Helen's word, the court mm -hmm. don't use that word. So what's happened is the parent who deviates farthest from the conventional heteronormative two-parent family but is going to be the one that is alleged and accused of being deviant. And I remember there's an older case where the, the father wanted to stay at home and be a full-time caretaker. And he was said he was told we can't do that because that deviates from the norm of the particular family that we think should exist in England and Wales at this time. And it strikes me that all the examples we're giving of deviance now are all kind of sexually related. And that deviates from the particular kind of family norm. The children shouldn't be thinking about sex. They shouldn't be thinking about their own sexuality. They shouldn't be thinking about their parents' sexuality. And it's these, it's these di separations, and I keep using the word deviation, from a particular norm that I think we still have. The line that really struck me um, when I was reading the paper was one tiny line about um, almost hyperconformity itself being deviant. And I was reminded of a really old um, study of adoption placement practices, um, which found that people were um, ruled out for adoption because their flower beds were too straight. <laughs> <laughs> um, and another example was being ruled out because I think there was a grand piano and lots of books, and that this was unreasonable <laughs> expectations on the child to play the piano. And <laughs> actually almost be so conforming that you um, come with the thereby deviant. Does any of our four panel members mm. want to have any last word? There's so much to talk about. I'm sure we'll carry on this discussion upstairs. Uh, thank you all so much for coming. This has been a wonderful discussion. I'm sure Helen will be putting us right in <laughs> all sorts of levels. Uh, but it's, it's been wonderful to have you all here and to engage with this. I'm sure we'll carry on this discussion. So thank you to all of you and thank you for